Good morning. You're welcome. Good morning, sir. You're welcome on board. I could remember when I was registered as number 001 in uh, 2009. I told myself then that when God created man, man was alone. And today, we have uh, over 7 billion people across the globe in the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria at the moment. We have members across uh, every nook and cranny of Nigeria. And uh, we are close to 8,000 now. By the time we have up to 10,000 members, that is when uh, we shall pass, uh, send our bill to the National Assembly to make us become uh, a chartered uh, body. By then, membership will no longer be by experience and qualifications, but by examinations. You are welcome on board. Let us take the opening address. I believe uh, you have your copies. My Lord, spiritual and temporal, distinguished fellows and members of the uh, Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria, from African Institute of Strategic Managers, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed highly honored and privileged to welcome you to this memorable induction exercise for fellows and membership into the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria. This institute is registered under the Companies and Allied Matters Act, Cap 59, Laws of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1990. I am therefore highly gratified at the response of many distinguished and eminent personages whose contributions and general understanding and conduct assisted in no small measure. In view to elevating the Nigerian standard of work environment, compatibly our ability to improve in our day-to-day -day administrative and general management of our endeavors. It is in conjunction, therefore, with our mother's approach of recognizing an individual or group of individuals whose endless responsibilities are not quadrant by illusion or center ego on job performance and specifications that today's activity is born. Creditably, our Nigerian managers and administrators are in enviable cadres and canopies all over the world. It therefore suffices to ascertain hearing that this much celebrated achievement of Nigerian apparatus are geographic, geometrically based on talent of experiences generated from convocations of this nature. One of the things that is not left behind by our leadership is the cognizance ability to honor outwardly, deserving people due praises in their lifetimes and not accolades after their demise. It is here for a center stage of this institute that a certified manager needs training and retraining in order to be abreast with fundamental experimental dynamics of administrative realities of the time. This in other words, hasten to elevate the standard of one's ability in just a position with work value anywhere in the world. It is here for our honor to inform you that the prestigious direct professional membership of the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria will be given to deserving men and women whose socioeconomic lives are to a fire. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here as clusters, which according to Potter are geographically proximate groups of interconnected enterprises and associated institutions in a particular field linked by commonality and complementarity. The synergy driven from this network is what confers competitive advantage to cluster model of industrialization, which is bred from basic understandings as this. What we gather today will be of immense use in actualizing our goals in our various efforts. 
Having membership of the Institute is a highly colored decoration, as we are having synergy with reputable international fora as this. Members are therefore prone to professional trainings, through meetings, seminars, conferences, and other related courses at minimal contributions within and outside Nigeria. Members are also prone to improve and develop the science of management in commerce, industry, and politics by maintaining investigation and research into the application of such entity. Members are equally given the secret of success in business and the study and practice of its ethical principles with a mandate to raise professional practice to its highest. You are therefore entitled to full color membership certificate given under the approval of the council. We are here together as brothers and sisters. For in that way, will our mission statement be actualized. I therefore wish that we pay attention in our overall exercise, for we believe that Nigeria can be facilitated in general administration within her polity by many of us who are seated here today. Even as our Nigerian brothers are helping other nations. While congratulating every one of you, distinguished members of this house, I thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the welcome address to all the participants, or let me say all the inductees. That is the opening address of the Honorable Registrar of the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria, who is also serving as the country director for African Institute of Strategic Managers and Chartered Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators. From the opening address of the registrar and from the introductions of all the prospective members in the course of our introduction, Please permit me to use that word prospective members until after the oath of um, professional conduct of the Institute is being administered before we can now um, refer to you as a bona fide members of um, the Institute. We we'll discover that in the course of um, his um, opening address, he made mention of we being um, interconnected uh, people. And in IPMA, what we do is that um, we don't limit our membership to those who only studied administration or management alone, or those who are in a position of um, administration alone. It is spread across to everyone, irrespective of the position you are occupying or irrespective of what you studied in school. Because we believe that there is a certain position that you get to in life is not all about what you study, but it's about managing other people under you. Just like a, um, an example, somebody is a medical doctor. Yes. We know a medical doctor is a professional um, field and being a medical doctor, you must um, have um, gone through the university and also even been inducted by NMA. But one thing we should also have at the back of our mind is that being a medical director of tuition does not only require you giving injection or administering um, drugs. It is um, an administrative uh, position in which as a medical doctor, it is the only call on you to have a little knowledge of management slash administration. Because even right from our immediate home, whatever we are doing, if we don't have management 
um, if we don't bring in management uh, principle into it, or in order to try to use some managerial techniques, we will discover that even some home will be having a serious crisis. So that is why the membership of Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators is open for every person as far as you have the academic qualification and the um, experience needed in order to be a member of the Institute. So I want to use this um, honor to say a big congratulations to those of you who have decided to take the bull by the horn in order to be part of um, the moving train of um, Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria. We are going to move straight to the next um, agenda, which is um, the paper presentation. And um, the topic of today's discussion is going to be on the roles of a professional manager in a dynamic environment. At this junction, we always plead with all our inductees to please drop whatever it is that they are doing and listen attentively in order to be able to digest whatever it is that we are going to discuss here today. Yes, we know that there is nothing we are going to say here today that you might have not heard before, but it is said that the biggest room in the world is um, room for knowledge. And it is also said that when you are in a place like this, you try to unlearn yourself so that you can relearn and learn. You unlearn yourself to relearn and learn. So we know that whatever we are going to discuss here today, we are not coming to teach you new thing, but in order to strengthen on the existing managerial principle and also remind us about what is expected of us. On that note, that is why we bring you this topic, the roles of a professional manager in a di um, dynamic environment environment, the environment that is hostile and cluster as a manager, what are you supposed to do? The environment you don't have power over, the storm that is coming that you don't have power over as a manager, are you going to quit or you are going to build a ship that will help you to navigate through the storm? In the next 45 minutes to one hour, we are going to digest on that. And the person who is going to take us on that ride is no other person than Mr. Ebenezer Korede Oladimeji. Over to you, sir. Please, sir, check your connection. We can't hear you, sir. Thank you. So good morning, right. um, ladies and gentlemen. I hope uh, everybody can hear me now. First of all, I want to say uh, Ramadan Karim to uh, Muslim brothers and sisters and all Muslim faithfuls. Um, this is the last Saturday of the Ramadan month. So thank God the Almighty for bringing us here safely today to attend this online um, induction. And I pray that uh, it will be worthwhile. The title of this presentation is Roles of the Professional Manager in a Dynamic Environment. Uh, before I go into the paper presentation, I just want to give us a quick tip to all of us that are using, for those of us that are using uh, Windows um, PC or you are joining via a computer, um, the mute button uh, will be muted by the host. However, you can permit you, maybe after the presentation, they want to make a short remark, just press just press the space bar, your space bar briefly, it will unmute you automatically and you can speak during the time when uh, you want to speak. 
So this can be used during introductions and all that, instead of uh, clicking on the mute or mute button. Thank you very much. Um, so today is a special day because um, those of us who are professional managers are going to get additional um, people. I hope everybody can see the screen. Uh, administrator, we see the screen. Yes, sir. So the the agenda or outline for this presentation, the role of the professional manager in a dynamic environment. We hope that at the end of this presentation, participants, uh, our potential uh, inductees, will be able to explain who a professional manager is, uh, give a little look at a little historical background of um, management as a profession, as a discipline, as a course of study. We're going to look at the qualities and attributes, uh, the reasons for professionalizing using uh, an MSME case study. And we'll give an uh, example. Um, duties and responsibilities, functions and roles, challenges at the beginning, that's at the beginning of the business, and then managing self, resources, activities, and people. Uh, if time permits, we can look at perspectives. Uh, then um, general case studies on pairing some businesses together in passing. Then ethics of a professional manager in a dynamic environment. Then how to win in a dynamic environment. So let us dive in. The roles of professional managers in a dynamic environment. We know, uh, just like Abubakar mentioned ju just now, that the world is constantly changing. You cannot step into the same uh, flowing river twice. Uh, some people will wonder what kind of uh, logic is that because you are actually putting your feet into the same river. But the truth is that because the river is flowing, each time you dip your finger or your feet into it, you did not dip your feet or finger into that same water that you dipped in a moment ago. That one has gone. So the world is, in a, is, is one of constant flow and turbulence that cuts across every human experience type, whether it be political, social, environmental, business, financial, spiritual, religious, historical, technological, academic, or even mental or psychological. So manage this emerging scenario and ensure beneficial rewards from the ever-changing circumstances of human existence. <clears throat> Excuse me. Man has devised ingenious ways of adapting to and winning the battle of the corporate world. One of the ways by which socioeconomic communities or clusters uh, in organization win in this age is by systematically exploring and exploiting new knowledge and information for sustainable enterprise growth by trained members of the age that we refer to as professional managers. Now we're going to look at it. Um, who are professional managers? We're going to look at it briefly here. Um, those trained in management uh, generally fit the criteria for professionalism because the actions are supposed to be driven by a general <clears throat> set of principles or propositions that is independent of a particular case under consideration. That means it is generic, it can be applied. It, is, it can be consistently applied at every situation. For instance, if we talk about planning, if you talk about planning, whether you are in a hospital, whether you are in a manufacturing, whether you are in the tourism or hospitality industry, you can apply the same principle over and over again as you, as you work. They are, they are deemed to be experts in the field of management and to know what is good, in quotes, for the clients. And their relationship with clients are considered helpful and objective rather than subjective. So they are not uh, biased. They just give um, what is supposed to be the right opinion based on facts, figures, and data available. And then they gain status by accomplishment as opposed to status based on blood ties to the organization. In what, I, what I mean by blood ties is that um, if my father or my uncle is a founder of an organization, as we'll see shortly in the case study, 
uh, ordinarily, um, even if I'm not qualified, I will become a leader in that organization. But for, for the professional manager, against status and accomplishment, uh, I mean by accomplishments, that is by evidence of the result or what we think he should or she should be able to do. I think I would prefer to just use the masculine gender generally. Please permit me uh, for the uh, our female members. Um, they may belong to voluntary association of fellow professionals. This is not to say that everybody that receives management training are professional managers. For example, background, they still view themselves primarily as technical experts rather than managers. For instance, an architect who received um, professional management training may still view himself as an architect. Okay, he might, uh, another person is an engineer, he might view himself as an engineer, a civil engineer, a doctor, and all that, uh, as Elia pointed out. Um, so let's quickly look at the a little background history of um, professionalization of management. Um, the earliest uh, that we know of professionalization of management uh, officially was in 1891, when uh, Joseph Wharton donated um, about $100,000 to the University of Pennsylvania to create the School of Commerce. And uh, if we're going to put it in perspective, $100,000 from 1891 to 1991, that's 100 years. And then 1991 to 2021, that's another 30 years. So that's 130 years. So if you take the inflation rate at about 10% per annum, you know that you are talking about billions if that money had been fixed. And then if you add, if you compound, uh, use compound interest, of course, it will be a working sum. So it, 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 some of us who have financial background will look at uh, just come 100,000. It was a large sum of money there and it was very impactful. And since that time, some 650 business schools and over 600 MBAs have been created. Currently, business schools are producing about 70,000 MBAs per year and graduating many more with undergraduate business uh, degrees. Uh, professional managers now cut across various fields such as health, care services, um, engineering, teaching, education, construction, um, ICT, marketing, legal professions. Um, sometimes even in the politics, you find professional managers. So they cut across various uh, fields. It's not an end in itself to manage a given activity, uh, but to do it effectively, uh, within a given financial and under attendant constraints. So now let's, uh, based on this background, let's look at who a professional manager really is. Is a professional manager one who is uh, simply interested in management? No. A professional manager is someone who by experience, training, or education has acquired requisite knowledge, skills, aptitudes, and abilities, which we refer to as managerial intelligence and competencies for achieving organizational goals and objectives effectively and efficiently. Then underline the word consistently. It means he abides by principles and ethics, which I, 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 I alluded to earlier on, the general principles of knowledge has been taught, he abides by them. So by experience, training, or education has acquired the necessary managerial intelligence and competencies for achieving organizational goals uh, effectively and efficiently, consistently. That is what makes him professional. He is objective rather than subjective. So what are the purpose of a professional manager? All professional managers have a purpose. And if you underline consistently and you underline effectively and efficiently, uh, you realize that we, we also talked about meeting the objective. So all professional managers have a purpose to meet the needs and wants of their clients, their customers. They must continue to do this in order to survive, in order for the organization to survive, in order for them themselves, they themselves to survive. So because the graph is there, okay? It's fluctuating because we, 
are in a dynamic environment that is unpredictable. Since the 1990s, the United uh, States Armed Forces introduced a new concept of dyna dynamism into uh, the world space, which we call VUCA. VUCA is an acronym for um, the state of the uh, complexity and changes. So each of those letters in the acronym VUCA stands for a word. V stands for volatility. That means the world will continue to be more and more volatile. Volatility means likely to erupt at, uh, spontaneously. Volatile, unstable, volatile, okay? Then you have U. The U stands for uncertainty, uncertainty. We, we used to have, we used to be ironclad sure that it's not possible to do this or it's not possible to do that. But almost everything that we think is not possible has become possible. When we talk about the possibility, um, one of the professors in the United States changed the acronym for SMART to SMIT. I mean, acronym for object of objectives, so objectives and goals, which used to be SMART objectives. SMART in those days used to mean specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time bound. And then we say uh, it can be evaluated, it could be uh, repeated by others. That is smarter. But he says, if we look at it, we should remove those two, two those two, uh, words in terms of attainable, realistic. We should remove it. And now change it to SMIT, specific, measurable, impossible, and time bound or time phased, telling us that in his uh, write-up, he says that almost every invention, the discovery of the microwave, travel to space, the invention of the aeroplane, the invention of the submarine, has been, almost every invention has been said to be impossible. Electricity costs almost uh, a battle of wits between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. Because Thomas Edison, uh, he, he, he brought about the idea of the direct current. Nikola Tesla brought about the idea of the alternative current. You know, And the possibilities at those times, even before it was created, it was said to be impossible. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow now, somebody creates um, wireless electricity, transmittable from anywhere, and we can subscribe as we're subscribing to, to, to data to uh, MTN and all that. I wouldn't be surprised because a lot of things, some people were even killed. You know, Copernicus was killed for suggesting that the world is round rather than flat. Okay, so a lot of things are changing. Then the two other letters of the VUCA is C and A, complexity. It means that the world scenario that is emerging will continue to be more and more complex. Coronavirus came in 2019, November, and turned so many things around. Mutual suspicion, uh, antagonization, so many things. Complexity. People are talking of daily living. Some people are bent on kidnapping. Some people are bent on going to school. You know, so many conflicting um, goals. Some people want to be criminal. Some people want to serve God. Some people want to invent things. Some people want humanity to be great. Some people want peace all over the world complex environment and we all have our own personal goals different from the organizational goals and then the last uh, word in the VUCA acronym uh, the last letter is A A who can tell me what that A stands for ambiguity that A stands for ambiguity it means that a statement can be doubly intended it could mean this way or that way for uh, those of us who study uh, religious literature, you hear this same scripture quoted to mean this thing. Another person will interpret it this way. You know, you go to other religion, somebody will pick it up. Another person will interpret it this way. Even in the laws, <clears throat> there's a joke I had recently. Uh, somebody called a friend of his who were in the science class. They've graduated. They're okay now. And he said, please, 
can you tell me what is the second law of um, Newton's second law of um, thermodynamics? He texted him back. He said, "I'm a lawyer. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm a science student, not a lawyer." Now you can imagine the ambiguity of such a statement. It's actually a science student that should be able to understand what the laws of thermodynamics or the laws of motion are. But he quickly played on it and said, I'm a science student, not a lawyer. Even a lawyer cannot tell you the second uh, law of um, uh, thermodynamics. OK, so then we want to quickly go into definitions of what managers do, having uh, given us that background of a dynamic environment of what Coca is. Managers are individuals who achieve goals for other people. That's a very simple and short definition. OK, if you go back to uh, the earlier uh, professional manager, you see that I only now included some things. A person who, by experience or education, has acquired requisite knowledge, skills, aptitudes, and abilities referred to as managerial intelligence and competences for achieving organizational goals and objectives effectively and efficiently, consistently. But a manager, on the other hand, are individuals who achieve goals through other people. They manage, they manage what? They manage resources, they manage themselves, they manage resources, they manage processes, or what you can refer to as activities, and they manage people. They manage people. And then an organization consists of at least two, two, at least two sentient beings that function on a continuous or a relatively continuous basis to achieve a common goal or set of goals. Now, I want to also quickly make a distinction, just a tip, line and start position. Uh, for those of us aspiring to be professional managers, we must also understand that it's not derogatory to be called a line manager. Sometimes some people will be, because we have two types of position of employment. You have the line position and we have the staff position. As you can see on the screen, a line position is directly involved in achieving the basic objectives of an organization. That means it is fundamental. For instance, a doctor is fundamental, a nurse is fundamental to a health institution, to a hospital, to a teaching hospital or a primary healthcare system or something. That is a primary purpose of that uh, organization. However, for that organization to survive, it needs other uh, auxiliary or auxiliary services. So those ones, we call them staff position. They are not uh, um, you know, on a lower level. It's just that they're on a different path. They support and assist the line position. For instance, a cost accountant in a manufacturing plant. He doesn't know anything about manufacturing, but he helps to keep the financial record, the P&L, the profit, uh, profit and loss, the balance sheet uh, in the manufacturing plant. So he's very, um, very important. Then we also have competitiveness. Competitiveness refers to a company's ability to maintain your market share, to maintain, retain, gain your market share. If you are not effective, you cannot maintain and gain on market share. In fact, you, are not, you may not even know that there's something called market share. You may not even know how to arrive at your market share, okay? Your market share is simply uh, the number of people in your industry or your cluster who are producing the same thing as you have, and the number of people you are serving and the percentage that is yours. Okay, for uh, some of us who are um, financial experts, there, there's a formula for, for that. Then human resource management refers to the policies, practices, and systems that influence employee behavior, attitudes, and performance. Now, um, it started as a welfare, the welfare officer where the welfare officer tends to, uh, he, he or she tends to your needs in terms of personal needs, maybe uh, lunch, um, off days, um, leave, and little stuff like that. But it has expanded since those days to personnel management. Personnel management now encompasses every aspect of the personnel on board or in the organization. And then now we now call it human resource management. And then we're going back to personnel again. We are now calling it people management. If you see some uh, complementary card now, you see manager, people, director, people. You only say comma after it. You'll be wondering, what are they talking about? 
it's because we are looking at the uh, stringent or critical importance of the human element to the success of any organization. Now, so as a corollary to this, we want to quickly look at the roles of the professional manager. The, in a given day, managers face immense workloads, which are diverse and complex. They are fragmented. There are time constraints. And then you have to, like the economics, you have to choose between alternatives based on the costs, on the benefits, on the results. You have to, you have to use your discretion. You know, so the manager sites are generally open ended. It could be unstructured, varied, fragmented, and prone to interruptions. But they prefer the more active and non routine elements of their work, which is the live action leading to fast decision making. That's when a true manager comes out. When there's a fire, that's when you know those who are, are, are they have the mindset to have a presence of mind to deal with the fire, not the, the, the person who goes hysterical shouting, hey. Oh, shouting and shouting and shouting, running over in circles. He can run maybe one kilometer in 30 minutes, not having done anything. Just struck down with paranoia. Okay, so they organize and regulate face-to-face -face contact with peers and subordinates for reports, advice, discussion, and then they give and receive instruction. Actually, the manager's role mainly revolves around communication and information. Mainly revolves around communication inform and information. How does he receive information? How does he utilize it? How does he disseminate it? Those are the three principal things that a professional manager does. Because information will lead to decision making, will affect activities, will affect your, 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 your resources. If you, for instance, you're doing stock taking now, if you do not have uh, information about the reorder level. How do you cope? How, how, you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll just be caught in the corner because you didn't plan for it. The same thing, due to the complexity and constant overload of work, they are pressured to incessantly battle their ever-changing time and space context. Time and space. Can you be at, this, at two places at the same time? No, you can't be in Maiduguri and still be in Lagos. And you can't you can be, be doing two activities. In fact, sometimes we're so limited that you cannot even listen at two programs at the same time. You can't listen to two presentations at the same time. If, if you want to try it now, as we're having this online virtual meeting and I'm making the presentation, switch on to another online meeting and then wear a headphone, okay? Connect two headphones. You'll discover that when you are listening to one, you cannot hear the other. Even when you open it and you are hearing the two jumping together, your mind is trained to focus on one speaker at a time, so you'll be switching. But the way the mind is, what we call multitasking, is that you can actually flow because where you left off, there's, there'll be a, a gap, and then you, you, you come back to it, you continue. So by the time you are going to write a report, if you're going to be tested, you, the, the flow will be consistent with what you have been able to catch in each of the presenter's speech. Then the defining context of managerial work, therefore, is immediacy and the cultivation and use of soft skills that determine that behavior. So principally, we talked about principles of management or the fundamentals, the fundamentals of management. Uh, we say organizing, planning, directing, coordinating, controlling of staff, organizing, planning, directing, coordinating, and controlling an organization and staff. These are the fundamentals. These, these are basically, each of these area is a lot of coursework. If you want to take organization, you can break it down to individual level, departmental level, um, uh, 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 organization as company-wide level, uh, community-wide, um, social, graphic, um, geopolitical, uh, regional level and and stuff and and, and and all that. The same thing with planning. You have different types of planning. You know, you have scheduling. Sometimes you may you have to go into project management. You have to go into gun chat to know okay what are activities that are running concurrently, which activity ends before this one takes over. You know, for those of us who have studied uh, project management and then directing is also a lot of activities. 
that is also embedded there. Then coordinating, controlling, where you put in place uh, certain structures, certain boundaries to ensure that the direction that you have uh, uh, determined or predetermined is attained. So the context of contemporary, contemporary ever-changing environment in which organization exists give rise to three key roles of the professional manager. I've already uh, established that um, the roles primarily of the professional manager has to do with communication and information man management. So one, you have the interpersonal reflecting on how managers obtain information. Two, you have to do with informational for monitoring and disseminating information. Three, it has to do with decisional, which justifies the manager's authority and power to access information. Informational competency implies that information is a critical resource for the manager. Thus, the manager's informational role seems to, to tie all managerial work together. How he obtains the information, how he's able to monitor and disseminate, and then how he's able to utilize that information, especially at critical moments that are going to bring uh, landmarks or milestones to the organization. So managers hold strategic position in the organizational hierarchy, which offers them a unique opportunity to have substantive exchanges with both the external and internal environment and to disseminate and share information internally. And that's why a manager should be able to carry out SWOT analysis effortlessly. Of course, we can do that with his team. SWOT SF analysis can be put on a, on a table you know, SF, success and failure history. In this project, we, we were able to achieve 60%. We scored 10% here in this project. So you have that table and then you have your SWOT. Apart from the SF, you have your SWOT strengths. What are your internal, what are your internal strengths? Your internal strengths could be that you are very competent or you have a patent on, on, on a certain invention. So that's a strength. You have all the documentation. So that's a strength. You have highly uh, competent staff, that's another strength. You know, you have highly disciplined staff that are well bonded, that's another strength. So you can list all your strengths and then your weaknesses. Your weaknesses, you could be that you don't have enough financial um, backbone uh, for a, lengthy, a, a, a certain length of time. Probably at a particular time, you can run the company successfully. If nothing happens, all things being equal, you can continue to run it for uh, maybe one year or two, but uh, at any time, any sudden um, event that is adverse happens, it could jeopardize. So that could be a weakness. Okay. So uh, the, the other weaknesses could also be that uh, you have you are very small. Um, maybe you lack certain uh, traits or attributes or competencies, and so on. You can identify them. You can set up uh, a consultancy panel. They can look at it and then they help you do that. But the good news is that you have your control over your strengths and weakness. If, you're, if you have listed your strengths and you notice that there are very few, you can take steps to improve your strengths. And then you can also take steps to mitigate your weaknesses or to even eliminate those weaknesses altogether. If you have maybe a lot of people playing trancy, they are not serious and all that, that's a weakness. You may be able to take steps but then you now come to the other quadrant. You have the opportunities quadrant and the threats quadrant. The opportunity quadrant is the where you have carried out, maybe you carry out a PESO analysis. A PESO analysis is not what you used to pound the apple. It's just an acronym, P-E-S-T-L-E, -E, to show that you have been able to look at the political, the economic, the social, the legal, the technological, the educational environment to look at what is happening. And you're able to look at it. Okay, what and what? Where can we take advantage of? So opportunities are um, events, policies, programs beyond your control that are favorable. That if you are prepared, you can take advantage of. And then threats are the opposite. Threats are events, activities beyond your control. Which, have, which may have adverse consequences on you if they are not quickly mitigated. You can't, you, you can't predict them, but when they come, 
you may have to take measures to meet because they are beyond your control. You are not the one that caused it. The government can come and, and make a policy. That policy, every policy that the government makes actually can be an opportunity or can be a threat to you depending on your state of mind and how well you are prepared, whether you are proactive to respond or you are reactive to that situation. Okay, so that we don't waste uh, too much time, I will just keep on some of these areas and go to the midst of the presentation. So now, why professionalize? We have three main reasons why uh, we professionalize, but we're going to uh, take a case study of uh, a small, maybe a family firm. Okay, so a family firm. Uh, will, will be used in this case study. Let's take A, B, C, and Co. Founded by uh, maybe um, let's say Abdul Ab, uh, uh, Abdul Oye, and he is into transport. He started as a transport and logistics. He took advantage, like we just talked about uh, SWOT. Now he took advantage of um, the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and he started a logistic and transport firm. He doesn't really concentrate on moving people. He concentrates on moving items, parcels, uh, documents, uh, equipment, and all that. So why would such a person with such a passion want to professionalize? He already feels he has, he knows everything. But eventually, when the company is growing, it will get to a time that he realizes that there's a common a lack of management talent within the organization because it's small, you know? If you just come across a certain roadblock, it could be banking transaction. You realize, hey, so I need an accountant. Ah, I need a, an auditor. That is when you begin to realize that you need some professional managers, okay? Otherwise, the company will soon fold up. You could also decide that, okay, he needs a fleet manager, okay? But when it started, he has enough knowledge at the beginning to overcome any of those objections and all that. So he's doing well. But by the time he's got, maybe he starts at the micro level, MSME stands for micro, small, and medium enterprises. So by the time he starts at the micro level, maybe one or two people, his students are there. You know, he just employs like uh, two or three people to run the, uh, maybe the logistic services. But by the time he's growing, he's growing. In that, there will be some emerging challenges that will push him to want to professionalize. A second reason for, I'm just paraphrasing, you can read um, the right of at length. A second reason for professionalizing management is to change norms and values. Because sometimes you discover that this is how we have been doing it. This is how we have been doing it. Uh, according to a famous scientist, man of the century, he said, only a mad person will expect a different result if you continue to do things the same way that you have always done it. If you pour water into a cup and the cup is facing downward, you cannot expect the water to enter the cup. And then you turn the cup upside down, you are pouring water from a bottle into the cup and you are expecting water to enter the cup. If I demonstrate it, assuming this is a physical class and I demonstrate it, a lot of you will start laughing. You will know that this person is bad. Because of, and then if you turn the, the, the cup right side up and you are pouring the water, it will always go. And then to, to, to also illustrate for that, if you continue to pour when the cup is filled and you keep pouring, it will overflow. That's the result you will get. So that, that, you know, so the second reason is to change norms. There are some certain norms. This is how we have been doing things. If you look at the history of this is how we have been doing things, a lot of companies have perished because of this is how we've been doing things, unable to change. And so sometimes you need to infuse new blood. You know, it could be a fresh graduate, it could be someone who has been well experienced, somebody who has been well trained to infuse new norms and values into the organization. So of course, that does not mean that all family values are rubbish, no. In fact, if you look at Joseph Walton and the empire he created, Walmart, you discover that it's a family, it, it, it started 
up to today is still a family business. In the Forbes list, I think they have up to like two or three uh, Waltons. And there are so many family companies, but what they did is that they keep professionalizing. Even though it's a family-run business, as much as possible. So our traditional family values that are good is retained. Those that are not good is uh, discarded. Okay. Then um, another reason. Let me go to the third reason. Is succession planning, leadership succession. The founder or family leader may want to retire. I may feel that. Hmm, if I leave these people like this, they will just destroy this. And I want them to be able to leave on my legacy. I want them to leave on my legacy. For everybody that wants to succeed in life, so success is made up of three ladders. The four O level certificate is also another achievement. And so on and so forth. Until you get your PhD, even marrying, giving birth, those are achievements. And then the second level of success is fulfillment. You can achieve without getting fulfillment. And you can achieve and get fulfillment. When you are satisfied and you are happy with your achievement, that's the second level. That is fulfillment. Okay? So, but after fulfillment, there's a third level. That is legacy. Legacy is the highest level of, ach level of ach achievement. That's why. Sometimes you hear um, those people who aspire to greatness, when they have acquired enough, they start giving back to the society. You know, recently, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, I think they are, I, I, I think they are the richest uh, couple, married couple in the world. Um, just like uh, Jeff Bezos uh, broke up with his wife, he too uh, decided to announce, they, 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 they announced that, that, that they're breaking up. You know, they are divorcing after 27 years of, of, of marriage. Okay, that tells you a lot of things. There's a lot of leadership lessons to be learned. It means that at that point, either they are breaking up because each of them want to pursue their legacy. They are not, they, they may be fulfilled, but they have not achieved a legacy. Or they feel that they want to go to a higher uh, level of relevance for humanity. After all, they are the highest um, charity donors in history to, 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 to date. So the third reason for acquiring or development management expertise is to prepare for um, succession planning. Sometimes some of our children may feel bad. Ah, Daddy, how can you do this? How can you say no? Sometimes Daddy cares about you to say, look, let this man come in. You will, because you have a master's from Oxon, you have a master's from uh, uh, Stanford. You understudy and learn because even if you have a first class and you come into an organization, unless you are going to change everything to suit your own way, you have to learn the ropes of how they do it there. Very important. So those are the three main reasons. Okay, one is to infuse fresh professional blood into the organization. Two is to change norms and values. Three. Is, to, is for succession planning. And then sometimes you encounter some challenges in a family firm that can be traced to differences between the training and values of the family and those of the professional managers. This is how we've been doing it. But sometimes the professional manager can courteously, you know, without being um, uh, hostile or with Without being dominated again because of Jack Welch. In fact, all other managers of other large began to copy Jack Welch. He had to start writing books because he was so objective. Every year, he makes sure he selects the best, he rewards, he promotes them, he puts them in key position. Some, the worst ones, he let them go. So people, and he's constantly gathering data. He's motivating you, he's guiding you, he's coaching you. He, he, he was able to achieve.
the five levels of leadership. People respect you. I mean, people follow you because you have the right to be followed. You have authority over them. You are my MD, so I have to obey you. You are my superior. So I have to obey you. Tell me to come to work 7.30 or 7 o'clock. That's the lowest level of leadership. You have a, 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 the power of, um, of um, caution or discipline over me, so I just have to obey. Then the second level of leadership is leadership by permission, not by position now, permission. People follow you because they choose to or they want to. They, they, they give you permission to be their leader. That is based on relationship. The first one is based on rights because you have the authority. The second one is based on relationship. So people follow you because of the relationship they have with you. And then the third level of leadership is productivity those results every time and they are like wow 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 you know you are consistent remember that word consistency that i said you should underline earlier earlier on and then the fourth level of leadership is people development remember i just spoke about uh the ladders of success that i said the third one is legacy yes at that point you are a people developer and people follow you because you are reproducing yourself okay uh, I, I'm a very wonderful researcher. I research into various areas and I help turn organizations around and all that. But I don't have anybody that I can say, that I can point to that I have trained in my principles, in my methodology, in my processes, in my processes, my procedures. I have nobody. I'm, I, I, I'm not a people developer. At the fourth level, people development, you use coaching and mentoring. You act as a coach, you act as a mentor. You act as a coach, you act as a mentor. Because you want to do what? You want to reproduce. You want to reproduce. And people develop reproduction is, it's, is, is another four stages again, where people watch you do the things you know how to do. And then you tell them to do it. You watch them do it. Then finally, you allow them to do it by themselves. And then the fifth level is the referential leadership. People, we call it pinnacle level or personhood. People follow you because they respect you, because you have built legacies. You have not only developed people, you are developing communities, you are developing nations. One quick example I will say uh, is like Tony Elumelu with his foundation. I, I, I don't know him personally, but I'm so impressed with what he has been able to achieve. You know, at that level, he has he is becoming uh, a referent uh, leader. So I will jump over some of these things so that we don't uh, waste too much time. Then I will go into managing self, resources, activities, and people. Managing self, resources, activities, and people. Um, the, the challenges of leadership, I mean, of um, professional managers that we, I, I, I just mentioned briefly now, uh, we will look at them in detail later. That's why I say, let us just um, go through. Managing self resources and activities and people. An organization through a professional manager will direct, will make decisions, will plan, will control. There will be organized set of activities, okay? There will be sales and marketing, there will be manufacturing, there will be uh, maybe road works, there will be so many things. You have to organize it. What time? Who are going to do those things? What are the resources you are going to use to achieve these activities? Who are the people? Okay? So you also now begin to talk about talent acquisition, talent retention, talent development, talent rewarding. It's not enough to be able to recognize, you have to be able to identify and recognize talent, acquire and retain them, develop them and retain them. So, um, we have talked about uh, this briefly. Okay, so planning includes defining goals, establishing strategy, and developing plans to coordinate activities. Organizing means determining what tasks are to be done, who is to do them 
how are the tasks to be grouped, who reports to whom, and where decisions are to be made. Leading includes motivating subordinates, directing others, selecting the most effective communication channels, and resolving conflict. Then controlling means monitoring activities to ensure they are being accomplished as planned and correcting any deviation. For instance, you can't get a car, you have to request for it. That will be documented. And then somebody is also watching how much um, fuel consumption is being used. Somebody is watching that, okay, how many times is it being serviced and all that. There's a form of control through uh, documentation. So we're back again to the rules, which I mentioned earlier, but we're going to expand it now based on a study by Henry Nisbet, who concluded that professional managers perform about 10 different roles. However, um, funny enough, these 10 roles are still grouped under those three roles, those three major roles that I said has to do with obtaining information, monitoring and disseminating, and then utilizing the information for decisions. So we call them interpersonal roles, informational roles, and decisional roles. Please remember that interpersonal roles, informational roles, and decisional roles. So when you look at the interpersonal roles, for instance, uh, you have you can act as a figurehead where you are required to perform a number of routine duties as a representative of your organization. For instance, at uh, ceremonies, uh, at uh, meetings, and all that. Then you can also act as a leader at the interpersonal role. So you act as a figurehead, you act as a leader, you act as a liaison. A liaison maintains network of outside contact to provide favors and information. Okay. For instance, you acknowledge email, you send out emails and all that. Then as a leader, you are responsible for the motivation and direction of uh, subordinates. Virtually, uh, virtually all managerial activities involving um, the subordinate. That means you give them direction. Then your informational role, you have three roles. Remember, at the interpersonal level, you have three roles. You act as a figurehead, where you are representing. You have as um, a leader, you act as a, a liaison. As a liaison, you are go between the uh, organization and the community, okay? As a leader, you are giving direction, support to your subordinates. Now, in the informational role, you also have three roles. You act as a monitor that is watching, receiving wide variety of information. You are like the nerve center where uh, uh, information comes through, you know? And then you also disseminate. And then sometimes you act as a spokesperson. So you monitor the information, you disseminate, and then you speak about it. That's your information role. Now at the uh, decisional role, we're going to see that you have three skills. The, 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 the third managerial skill is conceptual. And that's when you need this uh, decisional role more. That is what really makes you the professional manager. At that point, you have four different roles. You are the risk taker. You are the, you are the risk taker. You search organization and its environment for opportunities. You carry out the SWOT analysis. You initiate projects to bring about change. You are the disturbance handler. You are responsible for correcting actions when organizations face important uh, unexpected disturbances. You're also a resource allocator. Remember I said you are, in, you are in charge of activities, of resources, you are in charge of yourself, and you are in charge of other people. It's very important. And then you're also a negotiator, responsible for representing the organization at major negotiations. For instance, contract negotiations. So this is what I just mentioned just now. I said you need three management skills. Your, your key to get into the doorway of management is your technical skill. Your what? Your key to getting into the doorway of the corporate world is your technical skills. Whether you're a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a driver, uh, a, a fleet manager, you must have a know-how. You must have to. You must know how to do technical report writing. You must have an understanding of timelines. You must have understanding of your field. So you knew you need to have that technical skill. 
either as an engineer, either as a doctor, either as a, 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 a entertainer, uh, as a lawyer, uh, as an administrator, as an accountant, and all that. You need the technical skills. It must be there. You 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 call yourself an accountant, and you cannot you can't look at the balance sheet and and tell us what it means. You know, they talk about final account, and you're wondering what what do they mean by final account? Uh, they're talking about reconciliation. You're saying what is what, what do they mean by reconciliation? Is it a couple? Is it a relationship? So you need those technical skills. If you say you're an engineer, you must have an idea. You're a geologist. Uh, what what was the what is an oil oil signature? An oil fuel signature. What 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 do you mean by uh, geological terrains and and all that? So those technical things are there, they get you to the door, but they cannot maintain you. Please, I beg of us, can we just mute all our um, microphones? I'm getting some, I'm getting a lot of interference. So you need those technical skills to get you to the door, but to maintain you in the corporate world, you need the human skills. You need the human skills. And these human skills, are interpersonal skills, interpersonal skills. They are relationship skills. There's something we call that a Goldman introduced us, although he's not the only person, other authors have also done a lot of work on an area that we call emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence becomes very critical at the management level, where first and foremost, you need to understand yourself not only do you now understand yourself, you also are able to know your strengths, who you are, so that you can go to the second quadrant. It has four quadrants. Self-awareness, which is understanding or knowing yourself. The second quadrant is self-regulation or self-control. For instance, you can just decide to say, if you are fasting today as a Muslim, you are showing self-regulation or self-control because you can actually eat. It's a religious obligation, but you can just decide to say no. It is self-control to say we have an appointment for 7.30. Uh, and then you calculate that, okay, because of the traffic, I'm going to leave my house at about 5 o'clock in the morning so I can get there at least around 7 or after 7 and meet the appointment. So that's the second quarter, self-regulation. When you say, okay, I'm going to read for two hours every day and I will be consistent. I'm going to be committed to that. Then the third quadrant is about social awareness, knowing people. That's why human skills, this second segment, this uh, second magnetic skill is very important, knowing people. When you meet people, how well do you know them? When they are speaking to you, how well do you understand? Do you even know how to listen? There are four levels of listening. You need to understand the first level, which is passive listening. As I'm talking to some people, probably they have an earphone on their head, they are hearing, but they are reading a book. They are not digesting, or maybe they are just there, they are watching the screen, but their mind has wandered off. It's, they are passively listening to me. And then there is active listening, where the person receiving the encoded messages is actually processing it on the go. So he's actually understanding what you're saying, but he's not utilizing it further than that. And then you have the third level, which we call empathetic listening, where at that point, the person listening to me is so engrossed that when I paint a picture and give him a perspective, he understands it and pictures himself. He empathizes with me. He's feeling what I'm feeling. If I go emotional, he can shed a tear. That's empathetic level. And then you have the final level, which we call the fast level of listening, where the person listening to me asks very fine questions. Sometimes can even shock me. That takes me to a dimension that I did not even know. This person really understands and you know, he facilitates our discussion. Our discussion now goes into a level that we may not even have intended. Maybe you are negotiating, you know, and the person gives you some ideas and then you say, oh, wow, I didn't even look at those ideas. So those are the four levels of listening. You have the passive, the, uh, the, 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 the passive, the active, the empathetic, and the facilitative. And those are human skills that we all need to know. Then the fourth core grant in the human skills of emotional intelligence is social regulation, social regulation or relationship management, relationship management. Okay, we say uh, coronavirus keep two, two meters apart. Uh, if we stay two meters apart, we will stay together longer. You know that sounds uh, as if uh, it's uh, uh, 
a word that opens it or you know, as if it's a contradiction. But what it means is that, okay, because of the contagious nature of the um, pandemic, if we stand apart, we can stay together longer. You use the same word apart, and then you use the same word, uh, another word together, which contradicts apart to, you know, portray your point. So, social awareness, social management, where you're able to know how people react, how you manage them. Uh, and then the fifth level that joins all the four quadrants together is called empathy. 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 Knowing yourself, self-regulation, knowing your or other people, your social circles, then relationship management, and then you have an intersection which empathy brings together. Some people say empathy is the fifth level of emotional intelligence. And I want to go to the last management skill, which is conceptual skills, the mental ability to analyze and diagnose complex situations. This is very critical as a manager. You will meet situations. Like in the introduction, I talked about the time space constraint. In project management, there are three critical constraints that you have to overcome. One, cost. Two, quality. Time. Every time you have an activity or a project, those are the three. Time, cost, quality. Time, cost, quality. So conceptual skills helps you to achieve in this area where you're able to use either maybe you have a methodology, you know, some people use a fishbone diagram, Shikawa's fishbone diagram to analyze. That means you carry out the root cause analysis and then they, they begin to map it to so let them know what happened, where did we go wrong. Some people use the WH, that is the W, you ask who, what, where, why, when, then H, how. So use the WH method, you keep asking, you keep asking questions over and over again. So that helps you. Okay, so those are the three uh, management skills. And then I want to quickly go into professional ethics. Competence, confidentiality, integrity, objectivity, resolution of ethical conflicts. There are others, but let's just stick to this, um, uh, this few ones. The competence we're talking about has to do with your technical skills and your consistency in developing those technical skills. It also has to do with your form and ability to perform the role that you are expected to perform effectively and consistently, uh, effectively and efficiently. Remember, effectiveness has to do with your ability to identify the right objective, the purpose. That means you understand the mission, the vision of the organization. You know what this organization is about. This organization is not for profit. They want to develop professional managers. It's a tall order, but they are bent on doing it. Okay, so the competence of the people who are able to, who will be able to achieve that means that they, will, they may have drive, they may be well read, they may be people who are uh, internally motivated and so on and so forth. Okay, then confidentiality. Confidentiality means that uh, you should have the ability to comport yourself. When you receive certain information, you should maintain it within a certain restricted circle. You should be someone who is worthy of being entrusted with information. I mentioned earlier that when we talk about these roles, the primary, primary role of managers is to manage, we should call it information management or communication information management. And that's why I put those three before I start talking about uh, the Harris uh, expansion. So confidentiality is very important because sometimes if you start at the lower level, until you get to a certain level, you will not know why certain decisions are taken. When you get to that point where some decisions that have affected you in the past have been taken, sometimes you want to weep. You say, wow. Because you now find out that the person who occupied that place before that you were criticizing actually did a better job, probably even uh, 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 make some self-sacrifices that you cannot do because you are now seeing some of the constraints and things that he was facing then. But you had already judged it. That's why confidentiality is very important. And then integrity. Integrity has to do with consistency. Consistency in appearance, in activity, in purpose and plan. Integrity. 
you go to you want to 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 carry out an advert and you 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 put the advert out and then we discover that the product that you the, the, all the features you pro, you promise in the product is not there or most of them are missing that means you don't have integrity integrity is saying what you mean meaning what you say integrity is like properties of of, of material engineering in engineering you you take a piece of metal and when you want to measure the integrity of the steel or the integrity of, of the material, we look at the properties, let's say density. And then if it has integrity, we'll say, okay, from the surface to the middle to the outer surface, it is consistent. This is the density all through. That means it's consistent. That's why some people they say he's what he's weight in gold. Integrity means that whatever you are, you are consistent about it. That's why there's a funny proverb that said, even among thieves, there is honor. Even among thieves, they have integrity, even among thieves. But they are bad people. They are criminal. They are criminally having integrity. Okay? So that one, we can't call it integrity. They are not honest because they harm the society. But honesty has to do with the ability so that we can trust you. We, we live in a world where we have to continually market. And if you want to market, we want to trust that what you say is true. And then as a professional manager, you also need the ethic of objectivity. You must not allow your feeling or your emotions to cloud your judgment. Objectivity is very important. For instance, in performance appraisal, when you are appraising your subordinates or your um, colleagues, your junior, your, your junior co co colleagues, you don't, because you don't you dislike them in one way or the other, now uh, ignore or neglect their contributions and mark them down or write them off. You have to be objective. You must avoid what we call the hollow effect. You must avoid what we call the recessive effect. You must avoid some other uh, distractions that are based on your subjective opinion. And then, of course, uh, you also have resolution of ethical uh, conflict, where sometimes you are at a crossroad between your personal goal and the organizational goal. Which one should you support? This is what my organization does. And this is a golden lifetime opportunity that is coming to me. What should I do? I don't know whether I should take it to, okay, my organization have, re, have rejected it. They've rejected it, but I know that if they had taken it, I'm the expert, but probably because of money. Can I go behind and collect and, and, and do that thing? So as a professional manager, you cannot do that. I will just say it as simply as it is. You cannot do that, okay? So then you also have, professional ethics. You have to maintain your professional competence, follow applicable laws, regulations, and standards, and then prepare complete and clear reports after appropriate analysis. When we say follow applicable laws, it means that you cannot simply, uh, you, must, you must maintain your CSR. Uh, traditionally, we are familiar with CSR as an acronym for Corporate Social Responsibility. But I also in, uh, I introduced another one. I say corporate statutory responsibility, which means that as an organization, you must try as much as possible. I know it's not easy, especially when you are having some ill feelings or you're angry that, okay, government is not doing this, government is not doing that. Why should I pay my taxes? Why should I pay my dues? Why should I pay my levies? Why should I pay this charge and all that? But it's very important that you at the beginning maintain because by the time you become a billionaire level um, professional manager, it will be very difficult. And I hope that uh, things like what happened to Enron will not happen to us, where documents are falsified to make uh, a company look very big, and yet the company has been rotting inside and out. Um, the case of um, First Bank is still under investigation, uh, uh, under investigation. And I pray it is well resolved. We don't know what really happened, but um, we wish them all the very best. However, of course, you will know that uh, we have a lot of sharp practices back and forth that sometimes backfires um, on us. Now we're coming to the final part of this presentation, winning in a dynamic environment. Under winning in a dynamic environment, we're going to look at the um, analysis, the levels of analysis we start at the individual level and come to the societal level. I mentioned something like that earlier on. So individual, your department or group, the organization, and then societal. So those are the levels of analysis because the analysis may be for training and development, 
it may be for net analysis, it may be for expansion, maybe product uh, launch and all that, okay? Or maybe for substitutional planning purpose, recruitment and all that. So you need to, to do that analysis at various levels. And then the time frame, you need to also have your time frame at the beginning. Is it short time? Is it mid time or long term? And then what are the criteria for performance? You need to be able to define your criteria for performance. Effectiveness means keeping your eye on the goal. And then efficiency means keeping your eye on the goal effortlessly, or at least without cost or at reduced costs. Efficiency has to do with cost, the cost of time, quality, and constraint as lowest as possible and still achieving the same. Effectively, effectiveness has to do with the right, you can lower the cost, in, uh, you, can, you can overcome the constraint of time quality and, uh, and, and time quality and cost and still not be effective because you are doing the wrong thing. You are efficient at the wrong thing. You can also be effective, but not efficient. You are effective, you are doing the right thing, but you are sluggish, it's at enormous cost. So we need to look at it. Productivity means that you also have to maintain output at a certain level without increasing input because of efficiency. It's very important. And then you, uh, we've talked about efficiency, profit, quality, safety, growth, attendance, retention. I talked for, uh, about retention under talent management just now. Uh, satisfaction, motivation. You know, you need to identify what motivates people. At what level of motivation, the hierarchy of motivation are they? Are they still at the physiological level? Are they at the safety level? Are they at the social level? Are they at the self-esteem level? Are they at the self-actualization level? And then, of course, you need, if what you can't measure, you can't improve. So you need to carry out measurements. Now, the measurement will be carried out in two folds, the objective and quantitative, or subjective and qualitative. Then, of course, the focus of all this is in maintenance and improvement and in development. Kaizen, or Kaini. Kaizen is a Japanese word meaning continuous improvement. Kaini is uh, an acronym we coin in Nigeria, which means continuous and never-ending never improvement. Continuous and never ending improvement, can he? Okay, so this was adapted um, um, when we we're building this. So now let's go back to the challenges which I joined earlier because we're talking about winning in a dynamic environment. So do you recognize these challenges and problems? Poor execution, you make a plan, but you don't follow through. Um, you have great ideas, you know, there's negativism, no accountability, uh, no training, poor or lack of training. Uh, inability to relate and motivate, indifference and laziness, abuse, poor listening, uh, outline passive and active listening, empathetic and fascinating listening, then lack of follow through, deceit and dishonesty, yelling and telling, not sharing information, lack of coaching. You know, coaching is partly different from mentoring in the sense that with a coach, you are physically present. And the coach is with you on the job to improve your ideas and goals about the job. Your, the, the mentor, on the other hand, may or may not be physically present to guide your outlook, your, 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 your aspirations about your job or even about your life. And then you have miscommunication, which is also a problem. There are other local um, problems too, you know. Idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic problem, which I mentioned earlier, where uh, this is how we have been doing it. This is how we have been doing it. Can force a professional manager to lower his guard or to become subjective. To so even sometimes you begin to feel hatred. You begin to feel animosity. You need to put on your thinking hats. Professor De Bono said there are six thinking hats. You can choose anyone. For every problem you are solving, you can choose anyone. He suggests that you choose six hats. The white hat is a, is a hat of facts and data. List everything you know about the problem. When you're wearing, you are, not, you are prepared to wear the white hat. Okay? Then you can also wear the black hat where you play the devil's advocate. List every challenge or, 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 or what you think, how things can go wrong. Every problem that you think can occur as a result of that project or that problem. List it. You're wearing the black hat. You have four left. You also have the yellow hat, the hat of benefits. List every positive outcome that can happen as a result of that. List it. List it. That's the yellow hat. 
then you had you have the red hat list every way you that you feel you can be motivated the heart of motivation then you have two hearts remaining the green heart and the blue heart the blue heart is the heart of process you list every step if you are to do it physically maybe you want to produce a shoe now how would you do it from buying to cutting to this and all that list it that's what we call the heart of process it is scientific this is the flow line and then you also have the green heart where you may face challenges, use the green heart, the heart of creativity. You know, green means growth. So Professor De Bodo said, use the green heart. So you wear the six hat, um, it can help you. Then of course, most managers are blind to their own weaknesses and how they inhibit employee performance in a dynamic environment. And I want to beg all of us that we should not be blind to our weaknesses. Sometimes I do what I call self-analysis and introspection, because I know that at any level you are, even at the Wallace Yenka level, you are still growing. No one is perfect. No one can be an island. That is why our workers say in us that as we're here, please open your mind. Because there are three purposes to uh, being a member and attending a forum such as uh, a forum such as such as like this. One is to remind ourselves the things we have forgotten. Two is to reinforce the things that we're doing. We're not sure, but we are instinctively doing it. We're just doing them. So when you hear it said by someone else, you say, oh, wow, I didn't know. Do you believe that for the past 30 years, each time I collect my salary, I divide it into four parts. I remove 10 parts that I give out maybe to anybody. You know, this is what I do. I remove three parts that I invest. I pay myself to, and then I enjoy the rest. And I didn't know until this man is saying it now. Okay. So, and then the fourth reason is that perhaps, perhaps, perhaps you may hear some new things you may never have heard before and you find illumination. So we, know, we don't need to be blind to our own weaknesses and all that. Being weak doesn't mean that you are finished. It only means that you should identify it and work on that weakness. So if you really want the organization or team you manage to become better, become a better manager by putting your heart in it and putting it in your heart. So what are the pitfalls that professional managers should avoid? Don't be uh, hasty, in making decisions, uh, bad judgment, inability to lead teams. Then don't transfer aggression. Okay, when you leave your home for work, leave your home at home and work while you're at work. When you get home, enjoy the home environment. Leave off. We have just been able to spread a little window into what um, uh, uh, empathy and the emotional intelligence uh, is about, okay? So inability to learn from their mistakes, dealing with conflict. Sometimes we don't even know how to deal with conflict because we're not willing to confront. Sometimes dealing with conflict, you might do avoidance, you might use substitution, you might use uh, elimination. Sometimes you must use confront, you must confront the conflict and deal with it. Then poor administrative skills, you may not be very good in planning or organizing. Then lack of business sense. You can read books. You can join uh, programs online that begins to tell you ideas. You know, you don't need to bog yourself down with why we just 30 minutes every day. You can subscribe to YouTube Premium so that you don't have the adverts distracting you. Okay. It's just about um two, I think about two thousand or one one five or so, you know, per month. And you 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 don't have any extra and then you have a lot of learning that you can, you know. Then you also have a lack of strategic thinking. We can also work on that for delegation skills. We are all working in progress. Don't feel afraid that if you are there, uh, if you are no longer there, or if you don't do that job, nobody else can do it exactly the way you can do it. You know, God forbid, the benefit should happen to you. It's just one minute. It's just one minute. In fact, I got angry one day. I said, even this one minute, they don't even allow the one minute to, to reach one minute. But they will say, uh, may the sort of people departed through the mercy of God. If you look at it, it's only football. It's only a football match that I have watched live that they did one minute. I think it was one last night match, or I can't remember the match in particular, that there was a time, everybody was watching the time, and they say one minute, everybody got up, and then when the time I went for 60 seconds, wow. I say, wow, so I can actually witness one, and that's it. So why kill yourself? Learn to delegate, trust, you know, you can delegate in batches, and trust, then retain accountability. 
give responsibility, return accountability, follow up, that's the part of coaching and mentoring. And then the terms of the 10 M's of management, uh, this is just a bonus, just a nice to know manpower, material, money, uh, methods, machine, moral value, management, message, market. Market is very, very critical, very critical for anything that you're doing. Anything, anything at all. Even the coffee maker wants people to die. <laughs> like I have a market, but for me, will not be their customers. Uh, mentality, measurement, whatever you can't measure, you cannot improve. So um, I will leave us with this. Uh, these are some statistics um, from overseas about uh, the effectiveness of managers in today's dynamic environment. Um, it's very interesting that 50% of managers fail in their job. Uh, and another person has found a failure rate of 40 to 67%. 50% of managers didn't know that improving service quality will reduce operating costs. 50% of managers didn't understand people repeat behavior that is rewarded. So you can have positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. When you have positive reinforcement, it means that each time your subordinate or your peer does something that is good, you pat them on the back, you comment on it. Even if you don't put it down and write it, come on and comment it. It comes early and you kept quiet. Okay? And then negative reinforcement, when somebody does something that is wrong, also caution that person consistently. So the managers didn't think it is right to brag about an employee for the others. So thought of managers don't set goals with their employees. That is almost 7, 60 to 70 percent. Then 70 percent of managers didn't believe the best way to solve an employee problem is through a mutual uh, decision making process. Remember when we talk about types of leaders, you say uh, you have autocratic leaders, you have uh, democratic leaders, you have uh, less affair leaders or free star. And then sometimes we get confused as to which one is the best. There are no best leadership styles. Maybe if you're going to say uh, best, you can talk about transformational, transformational leaders. And it's only posterity that judges to say, okay, this union is good, it was consistent. Okay. So when you are a less affair leader, you need to know when to when you want to apply less affair or freestyle. You need to understand why and when and to who you have to apply that leadership system to. There are areas where you cannot just sit down and you begin to say you want to use less affair. For instance, you're a class teacher and you 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 are training kindergartens and you are using uh, less affair. They will spot this for you. Even in Montessori, there's control. There's a form of boundary around that, you know, they, they guide those little kids. You don't use less of it. You have to be autocratic. To, this is your boundary. Sit down. These are your toys. Uh, your system. This is, this is what you do. But then they leave you to operate if there is a Montessori. So less affair is good when you are a member or, or a leader of a team of experts, people who are sound intellectual, people who are creative geniuses. You only guide, you guide them. Because this would know they have the moral core, they have the ethics to do what is necessary. So you just get feedback and all that. So you use this effect. You don't use uh, autocratic for such people. Okay. So you use, so democratic is when you have people who are equally balanced and then, you know, you can get feedback and, and then you take decision together. So you must know who to this. Is. 80 to 95% of service or quality problems are management related. This is a very strong debate. Um, each time I bring it up, we, you know, we challenge ourselves and all that, but we don't have the time for that. 91% of employees want more recognition on, and only 50% say they get any at all. So how do you improve employee satisfaction? If you make your employees feel valued and important, if you make them feel valued, they will have more job satisfaction. Engage your employees. Fifty percent of employees' time is idle, and they do not work. Sometimes, if you don't put in place measures to stop them, they fill those idle time with chatter or emails. Fifty-five percent of employees are unsatisfied with their jobs. Sixty-one percent feel that they weren't treated as professionals and wanted more respect. In North America, 65% say they weren't recognized at all in the past year, and so on and so forth. 
what do we need to do to overcome all these challenges? I'll be running up shortly. You need to set clear goals and expectations. That gives 16% improvement. Training. You need an ST study. ASTD has changed their name now. You know, they used, they used to be the American um, uh, Society for Training and Development, but now they are Association for Talent Development. The uh, uh, Association for Talent Development, in case you want to be a member. So they say training increases uh, average 24 percent higher profit margin. Um, communication increases the professional manager's competence by about 30 percent. Then coaching. You know, coaching very impactful, 88%. Then leadership flexibility. You shouldn't be too rigid and add 15 to 20% better result on your bottom lines. Recognition and triple return on equity for company because people are happy that you're recognizing them. They want to do more. You know, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Promotion incentives, performance improvement uh, institute says it gives 22% impact on results 22 percent that means promotional incentives can help then customer loyalty hiring personnel um if you if you hire the wrong people they can cause your company to lose goodwill they can cause your company to lose threshold they can cause your company to lose your niche that you have spent time building very very important as a roundup i want to leave us with this quotation by uh Supriya desai of uh, ASC, which I saw on LinkedIn, in today's global business environment, characterized by VUCA, which has started with volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity, companies cannot delegate responsibility for planning and executing strategy, strategy changes to a small cadre of change management practitioners. If you recall, the environment of the 80s called for companies to adopt a continuous improvement mindset. The 90s demanded customer focus throughout their enterprise. Um, now, all leaders must learn how to navigate their teams through change to be competitive in the face of constant market unpredictability. We are living in a VUCA world. We are living in a world where we, we, we might be sending people to mass. You know, we might, we, we, we might, be, we might be having uh, uh, 5G in Nigeria very soon. That means that it is possible to do hologram, hologram technology. I can type, I can have a device that will be typing on the air. So these are changes that we can prepare for. The ever-changing environment in which organization operates, coupled with consumer continuous change in taste, intense competition from present and potential competitors call for professionalism in management of any organization. So professional managers are characterized by their actions driven by a set of management principles and position expertise, logical analysis of issues with high sense of objectivity. They arrive their status by accomplishment and above all belong to a voluntary professional management institution such as ITMA. So suffice to say that professionalism in management is gaining ground since it has become obvious that it is difficult to direct professionals than to create professionals. So the role of professional managers are numerous, unstructured, fragmental, and situational demand. They differ from non-professional managers as they are globally focused on their vision, employ logical analysis with high sense of objectivity as demanded by, by their profession. The current global demand for high business ethical standards, social responsibility and corporate good governance call for the need for any manager to be professional. That means you have to learn to not only acquire those skills, remember the three management skills of technical, conceptual, and decisional. Very important. You have, I mean, sorry, human and then national or uh, exceptional decisions. You use your knowledge to make decisions that solve problems. The technical is just to get you to the door, just to help you to get your employment. And then after that, your human skills, your emotional intelligence skills keeps you stronger, keeps you going forward. And then, of course, your conceptual or additional skills helps to push you uh, forward. So I want to stop here and thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me the time to make this presentation and for listening. Thank you and God bless you. <coughs> thank you, sir. Mr. Ebenezer Oladimeji Koridi for that um, wonderful presentation.
we know if not for time constraint, you can keep us for the rest of the day. But that um, is not. He has um, talked a lot about um, being professional and what is expected of us as a professional managers, and um, also how we can navigate through any circumstances as a professional manager. And at this junction, I want to believe that some of us might have uh, questions or contribution or observation in the course of his uh, presentation. So, but before we go into that, uh, we'd like to know if the registrar is still with us. Mr. Registrar, sir. All right. Why while we are waiting for um, the registrar response, I want to quickly highlight on some um, key um, things that um, Mr. Korede has um, pointed out. That as a manager, as a manager, some of us operate as an analog manager, even in this uh, digital era. Some of us, we don't like um, delegating as a manager, and that is not healthy for organization. And you can hear from um, his presentation that um, as a manager, you should be able to dish out work to those who are working under you. You should not, if a situation whereby you are afraid that if you are not there, this job cannot be done, then it means that you have not impacted on others who can carry on your legacy even while you are not there. You should be able to sit down, sit back and relax and watch other people doing your job. So that, and that, that will show that yes, you really carry those who are working with you along. Not a situation whereby you, anytime you are going home, most especially in um, some of our government um, agency, you see a director going home with box of files. You see some um, or guard the agencies. They don't want to any other person to know the the thing that they are sitting on or seated upon. And some of them, a situation will even come whereby they are due for promotion, but they will not even want to go for that promotion because of what they are seated on. They don't want any other new person that is coming to know what has been passing through that table. All this why. All this is a bad habit for organization. And he also made us to understand that knowing um, um, what style of leadership is um, best leadership and style. Yes, some people, just like he said, might want to tell you that um, laser affair, but there are places you can practice laser affair quite all right, but there are places also where you try it, <laughs> I'm sorry, reverse will be the case. So. All these as a managers are things that we are supposed um, to be putting into consideration. In as much as um, autocratic um, style of leadership or management um, style is uh, bad to some people, to some extent, there are places that that is just what is required at that time. You just don't, the registrar used to say that a situation whereby you don't have time and you have a target to meet, you will not be asking anybody's opinion. Yours is just to dish out the order and how it is done is none of your business. And how it is done is um, none of your business. All you want to see at that time is the result. It is me after you have uh, gotten the result, that means you now call all your teams member to a round table that, wow, that's a great job. And hey, you guys can now drink to that. But at that point whereby you are on a hot seat, you, all you need that time is, um, is the result. And talking about um, 
swaying into the aspect of um, emotional intelligence as well, we discovered that some managers, some um, leaders, when your ability to be able to study, understand those who are working under you, that will go a long way for the healthy of your organization. Because as a manager, whereby whenever you are coming to the office, you are, only, you are always coming with the um, leftover problem you picked from the office yesterday or the, one, the new one you just encountered, just like um, for those of us um, who are staying in Lagos, we know what it takes in order to be able to go to work in the morning the hold up and um, also coming back at home, the kind of uh, stress we pass through. But at the same time, if you allow this to control you emotionally, whereby none of even, no, none among your staff can even look at your face and tell you good morning, sir, because of the stress you have passed through and you, are, you just look at the person and ease, you discover that the organization will start um, suffering from kind of um, some unhealthy relationship. And where there is no healthy relationship among workers and even between you as the manager and your subordinates, there's uh, bound to be a problem. Because as a leader in, in, in every organization, if you don't, if you are not the type that just try and um, mingle amongst your staff and even talk with them, note, share from their problem, know what uh, their problem is. There are some certain information that you are supposed to be getting that they will deny you of that in as much as you are occupying the position of leadership in that um, organization. Because their own will just be, ah, is it that guy that used to strong his face? Like what? I don't know. Who will go and tell him? Who will even tell him? So there is need for as a manager in order for us to imbibe some emotional intelligence in our dealings, even in right from our immediate home. Because it is said that as a leader, you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot give what you don't have. So we should try as much as possible to within our leisure time to go through some of um, the materials again, because I believe that the materials are all self-explained um, self, um, and there are things we can read on our own and um, also digest. So on that note, I also want to, I want to quickly know if the registrar is back. Yeah, I'm, uh, registrar, sir. Yeah, I'm back. All right, please, sir. Let's um, have your contributions before we take um, other um, inductees' um, questions and their own view okay. from the okay. paper presented so far. Okay, thank you. It was uh, a good uh, and a wonderful presentation from our fellow and senior member of uh, the Institute. So I if not for time restraints, is capable of keeping, keeping us here till tomorrow. A wonderful presentation there. A round of applause for him. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. So he has uh, taught us uh, everything we need to know today. And uh, that is uh, the beauty of joining the Institute. As a professional member, year in, year out, you will be attending uh, trainings, workshops, seminars within and outside the country. Thank God COVID-19 made this possible today. If not, uh, if not for COVID-19, we wouldn't have achieved this feat. Because since uh, last year, March, around March, when the whole wide world was in a total lockdown, it was then we devised a, a means of reaching out to members without uh, coming on uh, the face-to-face -face system we have been practicing for over a decade. And uh, since that time, at least uh, most people still uh, prefer to have the online session because you do that from your comfort zone, not like, uh, 
can, you can see that uh, so many of us are here. Some people join from Kotakot, from Lagos, from Calabar, from uh, different parts of the country. We are ably represented here. That wouldn't have been possible if we had to transport them one by one to be in the to meet in Lagos or Abuja. So we thank God. And the paper presented was wonderful. At least I, 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 I should be comfortable to ask you questions now. I know you have so many to ask the presenter, but uh, I would like to know who the first management consultant on earth was. Who gave the first advice that has to do with uh, the modern and traditional functions of management as explained uh, by the presenter? Somebody can uh, show a mood and uh, let me know. Let the whole house know who gave, uh, who, who the first management consultant on earth was. It is there in the Bible. Hello. Who can tell me who the first management consultant on earth was? Yes, I'll move and say something. Hello. Who was the first management consultant on earth? Okay, let me proceed to save time. You know the story of Moses and his father-in-law, Jethro. He came and met Moses operating as a one-man manager. 365 days, no leave, no transfer. He was uh, operating that way. It was when uh, the father-in-law observed his style of uh, management. And he told me, he called him, the son-in-law, if you continue this way, you wear out easily. You get home and become useless to my daughter. Why not choose among men leaders? Teach them laws and ordinances. Be adjudicating, uh, let them be adjudicating over lesser matters. Why you Moses will be there to give approvals? That advice turns out to be the first advice given by the first management consultant, Jethro. You can see that uh, in that advice, you get uh, planning, budgeting, staffing, directing, leading, the post call has been taken care of. You know, we made mention of uh, a good uh, one to be, being a good leader. A good leader is one that is able to make people do things for him willingly without coercing them. The presenter also made mention of uh, the aims of management. Management. You can see he outlined 10 aims, but let me take one or two. The resources are scarce and it has to be, it has to be allocated uh, optimally. As a professional manager, you are like the hub that rolls the wheel. Without you, all other managerial functions are useless. We are the last to be fired in any organization. At times, we die with the organization. Money cannot go to material to purchase, and materials cannot go to machine to produce without a man. And that man is the administrator. Let us look at a few M's, at least uh, two or three M's. That of a man. That is a manpower. He has told us off. At least you get the right people to do the right job. You get the right people to do the right job. Understand the attitude, the conduct, behaviors of the people working under you by putting a round peg in a round hole and a square peg in a in square hole. Get the right people. You do things based on the merit. Meritocracy should be your watchword. Not what I term the grandfather father son relationship. As in the case of Nigeria, where you have a peg, a square, a square peg in a round hole, and a round hole, a hole in a square peg. It is not good for us. That is what I uh, that is a grandfather father son relationship. Then another M, which you have to look into, is that of money, money, money. Money answered all things, so says the Bible. It's also there in the Quran that al malu, al manuna, zinatul hayata dunya. Money and children are the beauty of this world. 
the life value of every organization is finance. That is why the Companies and Allied Matters Act of 1990 stated that all information that will assist users of financial statements in assessing the viability, liquidity, and profitability of a company must be stated in a clear, logical, and understanding manner for users of accounting information. We have stakeholders in every business, stakeholders in every organization. The employees are there as stakeholders for salaries, wages, and other personal costs. Government is a stakeholder in our business for uh, tax. The, uh, the, uh, the, the providers of capital are also there for dividends and interest. The business itself for maintenance and uh, expansion. It made mention of uh, uh, the SMART or SMARTER acronym. Any tax that is delegated to you, that or that is being delegated out, if it is which is uh, not in line with, which is not smart or smarter, it shows that uh, that tax is dead on arrival. Any delegated delegated task must be measurable. It must be specific. It must be measurable. It must be achievable. It must be realistic. It must have a time bound which can be evaluated and reviewed. Under that, I'm taking time, time bound. As a professional manager, it is good for you to be an effective uh, time manager. Effective time manager. Effective time manager. It is generally, it is generally known that the time, that time matches on. And almost every time, people always say, make the best use of each day. Live every day as though it's your last. But such affirmations alone are not enough. We all have the same amount of time, which is uh, 24 hours per day. As such, good time management is about making the best of the time available to you. This also means using your time to help you attain both your short-term and long-term goals. Managing time effectively and test analyzing your goals. Breaking those goals into tasks and then prioritizing those tasks. This isn't always easy or clear cut, given the number of tasks you may need to complete. But if you set a clear, measurable goals and then develop an effective to do list, you'll find prioritizing your many tasks is easier. And in the end, you manage your time better. For you to be an effective time manager, you must uh, understand the principles of uh, time management. Time is also useless the minute your schedule is interrupted. The time management principles, the first is the principle of planning. When you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When you fail to plan, you stink. And when you stink, you sink. When you fail to plan, you stink. And when you stink, you sink. You have to plan where you are presently, the task at hand, how you should go about it, when to accomplish it. When you fail to do that, it shows that you are not a good manager. The second the principle you have to look into in managing your time, which has to do with time bound, is organize and uh, prioritize. You have to organize uh, in planning, you have a to-do list, your schedule. This is what I'm going to do to on uh, tomorrow or Monday in the office. 8 o'clock to 8.30, I'm going to be on my table to clear all uh, files. Then uh, 8.30 to 9 o'clock, I'm going to meet my subordinate to discuss the way forward. 9.30 to 10 o'clock, I'm going to meet uh, the customers. Then 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, I'm going to at least uh, uh, do so many things that will promote the companies. That is your schedule of duty. 
And uh, the second principle is telling us to organize and prioritize. You have to organize and prioritize, understand those tasks that are urgent and those tasks that are important. Remember the, the important tasks could not be the most urgent task in the organization. You have to organize and prioritize. Those uh, that are urgent should be dealt with before going for the important ones. Don't procrastinate. When you procrastinate, then uh, you may not be able to uh, meet up with uh, time. Then the third uh, principles also have uh, the 2080 rule at the back of your mind, the Pareto principles. Then uh, the fourth is that you all do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Don't try to be multitasking. Do one thing at a time. The important, uh, the urgent tasks should be taken care of before going for the important ones. The fifth principle you have to look into is to avoid distractions. Those things that will make you not to achieve the end result should be done with, should be trashed to the dustbin. If the Bible said it, that if your hands will cause you sorrow, cut it off. You must gather the willpower. Log off your social media account while you are in the office. Things that uh, will disturb you from not achieving the end result, trash it away. Then uh, also you delegate. If you know how to delegate very well, delegate to people who can do the job. And by so doing, you free up time. It makes you to explore into the unknown and you come out stronger and better. Delegation, you delegate. Keep yourself uh, healthy and uh, stress-free. Always learn to say no. Learn to say no. When you have an uh, urgent task to accomplish and your superior is giving another, is asking you to move on to another task. Learn to say no in such a polite way that uh, he will understand what uh, you are saying. Remember the first rule of 48 laws of power. Never try to outshine your master. You have to say, sir, if I go on to do this job, because I ask you to say no, it does not mean you should go and be rude to your, to your superiors. Explain to them, make them see reason. Except when you have people who, can, who are capable under you. That is where the other principle of delegation will work for you. But uh, if you have to do it well, except if that task that is so urgent is no longer urgent, but important, you move on to the urgent ones. Later, you can uh, come back to the important uh, task. Always uh, do the right thing first and all the time. At the same time, uh, the time may not permit, permit me to, to say much, but I would like us to understand the Ds, the four Ds of uh, time management. In managing your time effectively, you must uh, under, invoke uh, the power of uh, four Ds. Uh, the first D is to uh, do it now. The second D is to delete. The third D is to, is to differ. Then the fourth one is to delegate. If a task is not uh, urgent and it is not important, what should you do as a professional manager? Delete such task. It is a junk. Just like when you go through your mails in the morning, your mailbox, you notice that you have 1,001 uh, emails and uh, maybe what you need there may not even be up to five or 10. The ones that will cause you sorrow, do away with them, delete them. Don't waste uh, time on them. If a task is not, uh, uh, is urgent, and uh, is, if a task is urge urgent, you invoke the first D, do it now. If a task is, uh, is uh, not, uh, is not is important, but not urgent, then uh, you have to differ, but don't procrastinate. To such a time that uh, important that uh, important task could become uh, problematic for you to handle. If you want a year prosperity, grow grains. Ten years prosperity, grow trees. Hundred years prosperity, grow people. Thank you.
Thank you, sir, for that um, wonderful contribution. At this junction, within the next um, 10 to 15 minutes, we are going to take um, questions, contributions, and observation from um, what we have discussed so far. And please, anyone who has a question, if you know you don't have any question or contribution, please don't unmute your microphone. But if you have, kindly unmute your microphone and um, tell us your name once again, then let's hear your view. So please, let's quickly do that within the next um, 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. Okay. My my name is Doctor Sumanu from the Marvel. Uh, I have a, let me say this is the comment and uh, also uh, I would also like to answer. I mean, ask some questions. So the comment is uh, I, I really love uh, this. Uh, this uh, when I say training, uh, there are some new things I really learned, which uh, is very unique. Thank you, sir. Uh, like uh, this smart that is uh, now smarter, and the smith, in fact, is uh, really an eye opener to me. And some other things, but let me not uh, uh, waste uh, the time. If I should go on and on, uh, yeah, I will just use it to. I mean, uh, to commend the, the facilitator. Okay. Having said that, I have a, a few uh, questions. And the question is, uh, which is more effective? Is it coaching? Because you talked about uh, mentoring and coaching. Although it's uh, neither here nor there. Uh, when I was hearing, you understand, but I want to know which is is more better either the coaching or the mentoring or i want to know the difference between the within coaching and mentoring then number two it talked about uh, recency effect i want him to explain very well about the recency effect because uh, to me recency effect you say we should avoid recency effect uh, uh to me i i see it in two perspectives. Uh, one recency may be good, and the, the second one may not be good. So I want a more explanation about the recency effects. Then number three uh, is, uh, is about you, uh, the, the last you are the facilitator or the coordinator or what. So uh, you talk about uh, autocratic uh, style. Uh, that there's a place we can use autocratic uh, um, style. But to me, anything autocratic is a no-no. There's no way autocratic style can be, can, can thrive at all, at all. So the English word say autocratic. And when you check autocratic, you will know that it is, is a bad effect. So, because, it, it, even you mentioned about emotional intelligence. An autocratic leader will never have this emotional intelligence that you can meet with him and explain, oh, my this thing, my child is sick, or so that's the reason why I came there, or something like that. Let me not talk too much, but uh, I really commend everything about this uh, study. In fact, this is one of the best, even being a PhD holder. This is one of the best that I've received. Kudos. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, doctor. Yeah. God bless yeah. you. Okay. Um, All right. Um, okay. Go ahead, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you, doctor, for your wonderful words of encouragement. Um, on coaching and mentoring, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. Uh, I will just try to put it in perspective. Coaching is when a leader 
or a manager or a professional manager in our own context now uses his experience and skills to lead and challenge a subordinate or a junior officer to greater achievement directly related to the job. And various examples abound. But I want you to just see these uh, simple distinctions. In football, for instance, you find a coach trying to encourage or guide the players who are skilled themselves to become better. So what the coach does is to use his experience and skill to guide the player, in this context, the employee, to do better as related to the job. So coaching is a bit narrowed down to specifics of the job. It's like trying to define the difference between uh, education, training, learning, and development. Education will be described or explained as the general acquisition of knowledge that prepares us, that prepares us as human individuals to be able to face life in its various forms. That is education. So you have the, uh, the this lowest level, which we call the primary or kindergarten level. You have the secondary level. You have the tertiary level, and so on. Learning. Is, a, is, is defined as a change in behavior as a result of acquired experience. Let me give you a little instance with a child. A little child that is about six or seven months old is learning to crawl. It crawls, let me permit me to use the word it. It crawls towards a, a lit candle that has a flickering flame. And then the child, because he doesn't know what a, a, that, lit, that light or flickering flame is seeing is harmful. Go towards it, it attracts it. And you know children, they want to touch anything. So it goes to it and handles that flame. And his hand or her hand is there. And then all of a sudden it feels a sensation in the brain that, you know, that tells it this is pain. But it's not sure. It takes his hands away and moves on. Then after some time, he plays and crawls and comes towards the candle again and touches. If, uh, if the father is around, the father can be looking and carry the flame and hold it and allow the child to touch it again. By the time the thing happens a couple of times, when the father brings the flame to the child, the child looks at a six or seven month old child. But let me say one year. He looks at the flame like this and will refuse to touch it. At that point, learning has taken place. The process of bringing the child towards the flame, recognizing, identifying the flame, recognizing its power or, or ability to harm is called training. The process of changing behavior is what we call learning. And then you come to development, just like mentoring. Development is acquiring competencies for higher responsibilities. So in the case of coaching, coaching is directed behavior towards improvement on the job, while mentoring is directed behavior towards achievement of purpose in life or higher purpose in the organization. I think I can put it as simply as that. And that is why you can be mentored through a book. You can read books by John Maxwell, Brian Tracy, you know, books by you yourself, you know, others can read it and they may never have met you and you'll be their mentor. But for a coach, the coach will need to see you regularly. There are business coaches. They have, they set up businesses. You meet with them. They sit down. They want to coach you on being an entrepreneur. They sit down with you. They teach you how to write feasibility study. They tell you how to do a cost analysis and all those things. They teach you. Okay. But the mentor is, it goes beyond that. It may not, it may not be telling you that as related to your job, it could be higher. But a mentor in the organization likes to take you and develop your potential, not just to be a skilled worker. So the two goes together. And I will not want to say that mentoring is better 
Because sometimes you need a coach as well as a mentor. You need the coach to become the, pro the, the proficient, competent professional that you ought to be. And then you need the mentor to achieve your aspirations and potential, to unleash that giant within you. Then, uh, let me stop there. Then on the issue of um, the recency effect, the recency effect is simply our object, uh, our subjectivity in assessing performance of, of our subordinates via the, the subordinate, for instance, may have been performing very well. You have four quarters in a year. You have 12 months in a year. You have 52 uh, weeks in a year. You have 365 days in a year. Let me stop there. Let's not talk about hours and minutes. And then this person has been doing very well. And in the last quarter or in the last month, the performance dropped woefully, you know? Or probably you had a nasty quarrel. And as a result of your lack of objectivity, you use that simple, that, that recent, that, that is from the word recent. That means something that is happening uh, just uh, now or recently within a few weeks or a few months past to judge the performance of that individual. We are saying we should avoid that. That's the recent effect. As against the hollow effect, which I also mentioned, I said one simple attribute. Somebody, for instance, could be very friendly. He could be very friendly, but a lazy worker. But because he's friendly, when he sees you collect your bag, he says, okay, well done. And yet, it may be the uh, round, uh, the restaurant mentioned putting round pegs in round holes or round uh, uh, square pegs in, in, a, in a square holes. He may be a square peg in a round hole, but because you ha he has endeared yourself with his, cut, uh, his friendliness, which is a halo that covers him, he may be overlooked for punishment or other uh, 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 admonitions. So that, 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 that is that in appraising or in performance management. Then your third question. Um, yes, you are correct, sir, about um, what you feel are the negative attributes of autocratic uh, leadership. But like I mentioned, there are times when you have to be autocratic. It is to bring order out of chaos but you need to know when to apply it. Autocratic leadership is the best form of leadership when you have neophytes, people who do not know their rights from wrong. For instance, to get an army of well-trained workforce, if you use democratic or uh, laissez-faire, you will fail. And that is why I use the, uh, the uh, uh, issue of a teacher and her kindergarten students to determine that for their safety, there are other companies that if you do not wear a seat belt and they catch you, you can, the appointment can be terminated right on the spot. You get a strike. Once you get a strike, that's all. So autocratic leadership should not be misunderstood in the context of uh, how negative it is, but in the context of who is it for? Like I mentioned, autocratic leadership, like when you give, when you are onboarding, you are recruiting new intakes, fresh graduates into a nuclear facility. If you do not apply autocratic leadership, I don't know which other word we can use. Maybe we have to change that word since it sounds so negative. But what it means is that it, it applies rules, strict rules of behavior, strict standard of behavior. This is what you must do. This is what, when you must wake up but it has a positive goal, a positive purpose. It could be that if you don't follow those rules strictly, a person's life is in danger. If you want to learn swimming in the wide ocean, for instance, you must have an autocratic leader that will tell you strict instru instruction. You might even put you on a diet, but tell you, you need to wake up. You cannot bath warm water. You must bath cold water. And you think he's harsh. Sometimes they use languages that seems obnoxious, which I disagree with. But the idea is that they must enforce the rules because you know you don't know better. But you cannot apply autocratic leadership among experts, among professors, 
among scientists that knows this one is developing a, a, an invention in wind energy. This one is developing an in invention in solar energy. This one is developing an invention in nuclear energy. And you want to have autocratic? No, it cannot work. It cannot work. But generally speaking, if you know when, when, the keyword there, when, and to who to apply autocratic leadership, it always works. Um, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Um, then the second okay. question okay. I have here, okay. uh, there's a question, he said, if you have a boss, I think this is from Kenneth, if you have a boss that does not listen to suggestions, what should you do? Um, I thank God for the registrar. I think he has been able to mention some facts related to this, especially concerning delegation, acceptance of responsibility, learning to say no. So if you are being taught to say no, it means that as responsible professional managers, there are times you must say no, whether to superior officers or even to subordinates. However, the spectrum, the premise, the medium, the channel, the mode or manner in which you make your suggestions matter. Sometimes even timing matters. The channel, the, 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 the by which you convey your message, also matters because you know one of the challenges we we highlighted in this, because of this presentation is miscommunication. We didn't have time enough to extract. It. There are case studies on it. Some are very funny, very hilarious. <laughs> if you have a class that you see, you will be shocked. One, let me tell you one. Assuming we are all in a class now, and I come to Abu, is maybe the first on the row in the class. We have about forty people, and I show him a written one verse sentence that contains an instruction. I don't want to mention any instruction, but generally. And then I, I, I wrote it to him so that he can see clearly. And maybe he, he reads it like three times so that he can understand and assimilate it. And then I tell him, please pass it to the next person. But verbally this time around, not written. He passes it down. And then I tell the next person, please tell uh, the next person to you what uh, Abu told you. And so on to the 40th person. And then I go to the 40th person and I said, please, can you write down what the first person, what, what the next person to you said? I expect that if you have accurate memory, it should be exactly what I have written down. But I do know what usually happens. When the person writes it down, you will laugh. You'll be surprised, you'll be so shocked. you say, ah. So by the time you now compare what you wrote down and gave the first person and what actually comes out, you'll be shocked. And that is why sometimes uh, autocratic leadership style is applied so that people can be saved. You have methods that must be applied. The people, the plants, the processes must be, that must be strictly followed. Sometimes you have standard operating procedures. If you don't do that, like in, in, in piloting, you, you, you obey instructions, you learn it by instructions. Okay, so this is very important. Then in the case of uh, talking to your boss and he's not listening, you ensure that you document and then you pass it to him. Sometimes you share the idea. Sometimes you may use an open forum if the private forum does not work, but don't push it too much. Like the registrar says, Robert Greed, in his world famous book, 48 Laws of Power, the number one rule is do not outshine your master or your boss. In this context, the master is the employer or whoever is senior ahead of you. Okay, So you must push gently. If you push gently, eventually the pull factor will also come in. I think those are the two questions we have. Um, if there are other contributions uh, for this explanation, I think we can. OK, uh, sorry, once again, uh, Dr. Manu Sunday. Uh, rather than that uh, autocratic, what of authoritative? One, ah, okay. is it yes, not, is, we stroke it, it better well, than that. Uh, exactly, uh, we stroke it. Autocratic. Authoritative or autocratic, we struggle. Uh, thank you very mm. much for that word. Instead okay. of saying mm. autocratic, maybe we should change it to mm. authoritative uh, exactly. leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.
Thank you so much. Uh, and um, thank you, Doctor, for your wonderful observation. And I want to believe that um, the research person has done justice to all the observations and the questions uh, raised so far. Well, there are some uh, questions that are just um, personally directed to the Institute. Uh, yes, like somebody was asking if the video of the recorded video of this lecture can be made available to members. Yes, that's the essence of um, <clears throat> this. And um, at the end of the induction, hopefully before, maybe by Monday or so, the link for all the social media handle of the Institute will be sent to you, starting from the Facebook, um, WhatsApp, and um, the Telegram um, handle of the Institute. Though before we go, I will tell you the number in which you can send message to on WhatsApp so that we forward you the link for the WhatsApp first. Then from there, we add you up to the other social media handle of the Institute. And um, from there, um, such link for this video will be dropped there and other, including the YouTube handle of the Institute, you can get other training uh, videos from there as well that you can go through at your leisure time. So on that note, having taken all the questions and um, contributions, so we'll now move straight to the next item, which is the oath taking. And um, just like the registrar used to say, this part is um, the induction proper. All we have been doing since is just pre-induction exercise. So this is the junction now where you will be confirmed as a bona fide member of um, the Institute. And I want to believe that um, you all have um, a copy of the old form that has been sent to your mailbox. And um, well, if you don't have it, Andy, no problem. I believe the registrar is going to display that on the screen and um, it will be administered, then we can uh, follow suit. And after that, we are expected to print out the form, oath form sent to our mail. You sign it with your name and today's date and scan it back for proper documentation at the head office of the Institute. Mr. Registrar, over to you, sir. Your microphone, your microphone, sir. Okay, thank you. You can check uh, on the on the chat uh, chat box there. I've displayed the YouTube uh, link which uh, I would like uh, each and every one of you to subscribe to, and you'll be getting correspondence via that uh, platform. And at the same time, I'm also sending uh, the links of our different uh, platform, like that of the LinkedIn and uh, so others. So you can, uh, you, you can also, Lies with uh, Mr. Bubakar to do the needful. So this is uh, the induction proper now. Time for all taking. This code of ethics and professional conduct describes the expectations that we have of ourselves and our fellow practitioners all over the world. It articulates the ideas to which we aspire, as well as the behaviors that are mandatory in our professional volunteer roles. Therefore, as a member of the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria, IPMA, I, your name, I Abimbola Olani pledge 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 p
I just I understood that the police to reserve the right to suspend me and all dismiss any of the above promises which are voluntarily made by me to help me God. Amen. You can now congratulate one another. Congratulations to everyone. Congratulations to everyone. Mr. Obakar, over to you. Congratulations to everyone. All right. Congratulations to all of you. You can mute yourself, Mr. Obakar. I'm with you, sir. Congra Congratulations to each and every one of you. You are now a bona fide member of the Institute of Professional Managers and Administrators of Nigeria. You can use the signatory letters as a fellow, F-I-P-M-A, F-I-P-M-A, writing, the writing of your name. You can use it on your CV, on your business card. You now have um, the full um, right in order to use um, the designatory letters of the institute. As a fellow, you use F-I-P-M-A, F-I-P-M-A. While as a full member, you use M-I-P-M-A, M-I-P-M-A. And as an associate, it is A-I-P-M-A, A-I-P-M-A. Once again, congratulations, and you are all welcome to IPMA family. At the beginning of the induction and also during the, in the course of the opening address of the Institute, we made it known to all of us here that the mandate given to the Institute is to admit the general public by experience and qualification. Depending when the Institute attained a total membership of 10,000 members before we can now proceed to the National Assembly for an act to make the Institute a chartered body. And once that is done, membership will no longer be by experience and qualification. And in order for us to achieve this, you as a member, as an ambassador of the Institute, you are expected as well to introduce your friends, colleagues, and um, well-wishers into the member, direct membership uh, program of the Institute. Just like um, we said at the earlier stage that with the 8,000 uh, membership strength of the Institute, now if all members decide to put it upon themselves or themselves as an ambassador of the Institute to introduce at least two persons each, you, you all agree with me that before the end of um, this um, ninth assembly, we can um, boastfully walk onto um, the National Assembly with our appeal for an act to, pro, um, to establish the Chartered Institute of uh, Professional 
managers and administrators of Nigeria. We all need your cooperation um, in order to achieve that, because just like the registrar told us that we are here as brothers and sisters, for only in that way can we achieve our mission um, statement. You are all welcome um, on board. This is um, IPMA, and we are happy to have you all today as a member of um, the Institute. And we believe that um, in the future time, we are all going to grow together. By the time IPMA will become chartered, we'll be happy to see each and every one of you saying then the, that, being boastful of the fact that, yes, you took the, um, the bull by the horn when the institute was not chartered, and now it is a full-fledged chartered um, body. We believe in you. We believe um, in the management of the institute that within the shortest period of time, we are going to attain that. There is, this is another plus for the Institute today because having you all joining the Institute today, even if it's one or two percent, it is a plus to us in um, IPMA, Nigeria. And we thank God we even have over 20, 30 people who are coming into the Institute today. So this is a big plus to us. And we are looking forward to work with each and every one of you in order to make um, the vision of um, the Institute come to pass. Like I said earlier on, the signatory letters to use once again as a fellow is FIPMA. FIPMA. While as a full member, you use MIPMA. MIPMA. And as an associate, you use AIPMA. AIPMA. Um, please, uh, Doctor, who asked um, the first question um, that time? Uh, sorry, I've forgotten your name, Doctor. Either Doctor Doctor Do Malu, Doctor Malu Sondimavir. Okay. <laughs> Doctor Malu, please get ready to give us the closing remark after um, my announcement, please. So you are going to give us the closing remark before we take uh, the closing prayer. So um, on the issue of um, the social media handle of the Institute, the registrar has earlier posted um, the LinkedIn and maybe the Facebook um, link. But if you did not get that, no problem. Take this number down and uh, send a message to it on WhatsApp so that I can also, we can send you the link for the WhatsApp and um, if the, for the WhatsApp and the, um, what is it called? The, for the WhatsApp and other, or Telegram and other um, social media handle of the Institute. And from there, you get day-to-day -day updates about happenings and uh, managerial ethics and principles um, from us all uh, day in, day out. The number is 081, 081 Six nine six nine five zero five zero seven three seven three seven zero eight one six nine five zero seven three three seven you can send a direct uh, WhatsApp message to that number. We are going to add you up to all the social media um, handles of the Institute where you get a um, day to day um, manager. Please, can you repeat the number? Um, and uh, pray. We are getting closer to the end of um, the program. And a certificate for those of who are within um, Abuja, you can. Um, Walk into uh, Abuja office, um, I think by Tuesday or thereabout to pick up your certificate by Tuesday. Or if you are within Abuja, you can call by Monday, Tuesday, in order for you to pick up your certificate at number 16, Kotonu Street, who says on 6. Because hopefully by Wednesday might be public holiday. But notwithstanding, between Monday and Tuesday, for those of us in Abuja, we can. Um, walk into the head office of the institute and pick it up. And 
And as for those of us outside Abuja, we are hoping that between Monday and Tuesday, we'll work on all the certificates and it will be sent across to us. We are going to receive a call from, uh, from the office directly on Monday for, in order for us to get um, the details about how the certificate is going to be sent. And, um, but anybody who experienced any delay should kindly bear with us because from the look of things, because of the salary break, Wednesday and Thursday might be a public holiday. So, but notwithstanding, we'll try our possible best to cover whichever we can cover within Monday and um, Tuesday, within Monday and Tuesday. So that is that. And on that note now, I would like to call on uh, Dr. Omalu to give us uh, the closing remark on behalf of all the new members who are inducted um, today. Doctor, if you can hear okay. me, sir. Yes, yeah, I can hear you very well, loud and clear. Uh, so, yes, I, on behalf of uh, my colleagues, we want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Korode Oladimeji for the insightful, very, very articulate uh, um, uh, write up and uh, uh, his uh, lectures. In fact, it has been so very inspiring. At least we have learned uh, new things today. Then the, the registrar, our able registrar, uh, I kind of love uh, his dynamism, the way he juggles between the Bible and the Quran. In fact, I don't really know if he, <laughs> I say he's a Christian or a Muslim. So this has made him a true, true Nigerian, a detribalized, and uh, will I say someone who is not a uh, five gods when we the, the, the times of a religion. He has been able to marry the two major religion, religion together and makes us very comfortable. I want to thank the Institute for a lot of things we've learned today. And uh, surely I can say that uh, all what we have learned today will translate them into our day-to-day -day living and uh, at our places of work and uh, the things we do. We will not let the Institute down and we will be very good ambassadors to the Institute. God bless the Institute, God bless Nigeria, and God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, sir, for that um, wonderful closing remark. And at this junction, we have um, come to the end of um, the program. Let's relax what the rest with us while he did these um, contributions. That if you want a year priority, you grow grains. 10 years prosperity, grow trees. And 100 years prosperity, grow people. Thank you all for being part of um, our journey and for being part of um, this um, great body. We look forward to seeing every one of you in um, doing great in your future, in your line of duty, and um, in the course of your professional life. And to all our Muslim brothers, we say Ramadan Kareem, and we wish you all happy Eid al in advance. So on that note, I would like a Muslim brother, uh, brethren, to give us um, the closing room if we still have any connected with us. Please, do we have any of the moon brethren to give us the closing remark? Hello, closing Allah, prayer, Allah. sorry. The closing prayer. Uh, Allah. Allah. Go ahead, we hear you, sir. Lahuma Salam, Muhammad, Ali Ali
سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يقول وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Amen. Thank you so much. And um, if we should continue to stay safe in your various um, location, COVID-19 is still around the corner. And we should all try as much as possible to be security conscious because of the situation in Bye. the country presently. Once again, thank you all. And we are happy to all to have you all. All as part of the Ifma family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.